All right. Um, I know a lot of people just left, but in the interest of getting people home in time, I suppose we'll kind of get rolling. We have a pretty decent sized introductory portion anyway, so I don't think they'll be too upset if we go on without them. Uh, so we are the SS Phoenix Senior Design Team, um, the other team presenting this evening from Stevens Institute of Technology. Um, our project centers around a feasibility study of a floating residence hall concept, um, with our particular case study being at Stevens itself, but hopefully with the idea that it'll be able to be marketed to different campuses and cities, um, not only around the nation, but hopefully worldwide as well. Uh, my name is Allison Waters, uh, this is Jean Hahn, um, Haynes Duff, and Mackenzie Kingsbury. Great, so to give you all a little bit of background, as promised, giving people time to get back into the room, <laughs> um, we'll go into a little bit of what our inspiration was uh, for this senior design topic. Um, first off, this sort of concept is actually really deeply connected to the history of Stevens Institute itself, along with the Stevens founding family. Um, anyone who's heard of America's Cup in the room uh, knows that that was originally started by the Stevens family. Um, they designed plenty of steamships back in the day and were truly pioneers in the industry. And at Stevens itself, uh, we actually had a temporary floating dorm. Um, in the late 60s and early 70s, which I'll go into in the next slide. Um, and then going back to that, uh, we decided to name uh, our project the SS Phoenix because we are rising from the ashes of that now demolished dormitory and trying to actually propose a uh, more permanent solution uh, on a related note. Uh, so this presentation is really gonna focus around um, our proposed solution to the housing shortage that we see in highly developed coastal areas worldwide, but most specifically, um, we're gonna be talking about Hoboken itself, where Stevens is located. Um, we're gonna tell you all about the parameters that we've been considering for our design propositions. Um, we'll go into some of those preliminary proposals that we've developed, uh, the cost analyses associated with each of these proposals, and some of the simulation and testing that we've performed. So the SS Stevens was the name of this um, prior floating dormitory that we had um, more just off campus. This uh, really lovely building here behind the ship is uh, the main office building of our campus. So it was truly right at the foot of campus itself on the Hudson River. Um, she had a rich history before we got her at Stevens um, as the Dauphin and then the Excorda um, as a commercial passenger line. And then for a solid seven years, she housed about 150 students at a time um, when the enrollment actually greatly increased for the school at a quicker rate than they could acquire housing. Um, but once enrollment decreased back to average numbers, uh, she was unfortunately decommissioned and scrapped. So our mission as the SS Phoenix team here is to create, first and foremost, a really unique experience for students who are uh, residing at Stevens. Um, by doing that, we're hoping to really offset the need for uh, off-campus housing, which as you'll see in later slides in the presentation, is very taxing upon the students uh, research-wise, monetarily speaking and ultimately it can actually really reduce retention rates and um, a lot of the prestige that our school has been working to build up uh, over the past few years. Um, it'll also allow a lot of swing space for the campus. So as our honestly a little bit dilapidated dorm buildings are taken offline to be renovated or entirely replaced, uh, we wouldn't then have a housing deficit that's more than what we currently have. Um, we also, it's really important for us to make this uh, really competitive cost-wise with traditional land-based dormitories, not only in initial construction um, for the land dorms compared to the acquisition of the vessel, but also with um, general day-to-day -day operational costs. And finally, uh, we want to create this novel draw to Stevens campus itself so that we not only can inspire more prospective students to come, uh, more donors to contribute back to the university, but also so that we can hopefully see this um, really gain attention in the national spotlight as a viable solution for campuses facing the same issues. So to give you a little bit of a heads up about what housing is like in Hoboken, um, I'm not sure if you can see in the back, but there's this green outline here that shows Hoboken property. 
and uh, most of it's really expensive. <laughs> uh, so this over here in the red is Manhattan, and we're right across the Hudson River. So naturally, any sort of purchase or rental is going to be ludicrous. Um, and that's only getting worse, data shows us. Within 2017, just the past year, um, the average home increased by over $100,000, um, and the average price per square foot uh, to purchase is up over $50. So you can imagine what that means for renting. It is typically way outside of the student budget if Stevens isn't able to accommodate us. And quite frankly, at the moment, from all of Stevens' options, uh, we can only house about 75% of the student population. And we're planning, by, planning to increase our current undergraduate student body by about 30% over the next like four years or so. So we have a really big mounting problem that the administration is blind to. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> Um, so uh, <laughs> now going a little bit away from the real estate purchasing uh, market to the rental market where students are more concerned. Um, the top graph here shows the median rent uh, on a month per month basis. So it's really nice how it spikes incredibly right when students come back from break. Um, and then inversely, uh, the number of rentals available um, this is taken like day-to-day -day sampling on a number of uh, different real estate sites like Zillow, Trulia, all of those great rental um, places. Uh, you can see that there's plenty around from you know May to August, but then the rest of the year when we're actually trying to be there, there's maybe five apartments a week that are actually free for you to acquire, which is a huge, huge problem for students who are already stressed out trying to get through their course loads now they need a place to live. So here are some objectives that we have. Um, we proposed, we pitched this idea to uh, our Office of Residence Life at Stevens, knowing that they have to address this problem and really soon. And they came back to us saying that they want one of two things. Uh, their first proposal is to have around a 200 bed facility. Um, so this would be treated kind of like a novelty dorm. It's about the size of one of our individual dorms. Um, so it was going to allow, you know, that swing space I was talking about. As each individual dorm gets renovated one at a time on campus, uh, those displaced students could potentially be moved on board the ship. Uh, the second proposal is a much, much larger um, scale. It's about 1250 um, students overall, and that would be used to transition all of Stephen's leased housing so all of the apartment complexes that Stevens rents out in Hoboken and individually leases to its students, um, those would be no longer, those students would then move on board the ship. In addition to these like very two main size factors, um, they had a few other uh, desires that they wanted. Um, I won't bore you with the words here. Instead, we have a chart. <laughs> uh, so there's the threshold, so the bottom of our range versus the objective, um, really the upper part of the range that we want to strive for. Um, so that also includes, you know, like the actual square footage per student, um, the ratio of students per bathroom, all of these important things, uh, different like lounges and cafes that we might be able to put on board as well in some of the additional space. So we know that a project of this magnitude um, that concerns students this closely uh, is gonna have a lot of risk that comes along with it. So from the onset of our project, we've tried to really maintain um, a close eye on all sorts of things that could potentially go wrong so that we can take preventative measures against them now. Um, and then hopefully it'll actually come to fruition after that. So we have um, just our little chart here to show you what all we've thought through for the most part and a lot of the ways that we're trying to mitigate these risks throughout our design process. Um, I'm going to be talking about the conditions that we researched right at our project location. I'll <laughs> um, so first we did a preliminary search by looking up uh, the known navigational chart for the Hudson River as you can see. Um, this is Castle Point so the original SS Stevens was right around over here, and so now we're proposing our project site to be closer over here. Um, Stephen does still own this plot of land right here, and we supposedly also own the piers and um, boardwalk that are over here. 
Um, so from this, we were able to determine that the water depth was around 11 to 16 feet. There was no obstructions, and we really need to be aware of how far out we build a pier into the navigational channel right there, because it's used quite frequently, as we'll talk about later. Uh, we were lucky enough that a other project at Stevens was done and they had a bathymetry study done right at our project site. Uh, this is courtesy of John Miller. He's a coastal professor. So as you can see, we got more refined uh, information from this and we're looking at six to eight feet. Um, at the deepest, it's going to be 10 feet. Um, next, we use the Stevens Nye Hops buoys to determine some more conditions. Uh, our water level is around five feet, uh, mean sea level. The current is around 0.7 knots. The significant wave height we found to be around 1.6 feet. Um, next, we looked at the wind. So we um, tabulated a 30 years data worth from the Robbins Reef buoy, which is all the way down here. Um, the red star is uh, our project site location, so you can see it's relatively close. And it actually was the closest buoy that we could get a good history of data from. So uh, we put together a wind rose. As you can see, this takes even into account the information from Sandy, which is really crucial. So you can see the most extreme um, winds are very minimal and then in the middle. And there's not a huge um, directional problem where wind is coming severely from one direction. So this is really good for us. So when we do our morning plan and everything, um, there's not anything too severe that we really have to be concerned about. One of the conditions we were very partial on um, looking deeply into was the little wake waves that were um, from all the ferries and water taxis. We even have large cruise ships and barges that come through the channel. So we're looking at that more in depth. So we got this study that was also done previously from um, a Davis lab. It's an eight day surface elevation versus time. This was done in 2002. So this primarily shows two peaks, one over one in the morning and one at night. So um, what we got from this is that the channel is most operated when it's people trying to get to work and when people are trying to get back home from work. Um, and from this, we also got to see that the water surface is really only around one foot. So we're not really talking about any huge waves, anything too major that would inhibit us from actually going forward with our project. Uh, we wanted to also take into consideration any ice coverage. Um, I know my freshman year, I experienced the Hudson um, with the large ice, um, ice streams flowing by. Um, that's pretty interesting to see. So we looked further into this um, and we found this graph that shows the thickest thickness of ice um, from throughout the years. So it's pretty sporadic. Is um, one year in 2009, it looks like it's pretty high, but it seems to be um, tapering off. Um, this is measured from the George Washington Bridge to the Tappan Zee Bridge, and I know the Coast Guard also does more in-depth studies, but we determined from this there was not a huge um, impedance to our project. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about vessel selection. Um, as Ali mentioned, we're kind of going off of what the Office of Residence Life wants, so um, we're going to follow these two proposals. So first, um, we're going to look at possibly acquiring a naval frigate, which would fall into the first proposal, the smaller sort of um, novelty dorm for Stevens. So there are some obvious advantages and disadvantages. Um, the biggest advantage being that it would probably be free, and if not, it would be incredibly inexpensive to acquire. Um, but some disadvantages would be that we don't have a ton of information about ship specifics because it is a military ship. But we do know that all this military equipment would have to be removed as well as some harmful chemicals um, and that could be potentially very expensive um, which would just lead to a, a huge renovation cost. Um, so laying out some preliminary costs for this naval frigate, um, we made a ton of assumptions such that there will be a ship if not many readily available on the northeast coast so it wouldn't cost much to transport it um, but we would have to dredge to moor the ship so that would be expensive um, but in total it would cost about 3.75 million which means that in about five and a half years, Stevens would be able to begin profiting off of the students that are paying to live on this dorm, um, and that money could go towards maintenance or whatever uh, on the university. So our second option is a deck barge, which also falls into the smaller proposal of the novelty dorm. Um, some advantages of the deck barge are that it's incredibly customizable. We intend to put modular housing units on top, so just depending on how large the barge is, this could be very small or it could be medium sized. Um, so it could, you know, be flexible to whatever the campus wants or needs at that time. Um, some cons are that it's a little bit less stable, uh, and it could potentially cost a lot to transport depending on whether or not there's a barge available on the northeast coast. Uh, and some cost analysis for this. Um, so again, we made a ton of assumptions um, with this preliminary cost analysis, but in total it should cost about $3 million. 
uh, and begin crafting in about three and a half years, which is a little bit less than the frigate. And moving into our last option, uh, this is the only ship we're considering that falls into the larger proposal, so the 1200 student proposal um, would be a large cruise ship. Some advantages here are that uh, obviously we'd have to do much less renovation than if we were to consider a frigate or a deck barge, um, but most likely this cruise ship would come from somewhere other than America, which presents problems with transportation and U.S. regulations. Uh, and of course, it's going to cost a lot of money as compared to the deck barge or hopefully the free frigate. <laughs> um, so a cost analysis for this, um, we assumed a huge initial cost, um, but because it's housing so many more students, the return on investment is about two and a half years. Uh, the total cost is about 14 and a half million. But like I said, many more students means much more profits. So um, this is the fastest ROI. Uh, and here we just laid out our figures of merit. Um, these are based on what the Office of Residence Life wants. So cost is the highest and work required is the second highest because they obviously want something inexpensive and something that could happen and the work could be completed very quickly. Um, but we considered other things such as size, aesthetic, and environmental impact. Um, but after considering all of these factors, we determined that the cruise ship would be the best fit for Stevens. That may not be true for other campuses, um, but for our student population and our campus, that would be our first choice. So I'll be talking about the tank testing that we've uh, done. Uh, we actually decided to do a mooring test for the barge option that we mentioned earlier, option two. And the purpose of this experiment was to uh, analyze, or observe and record any ship motions that the ship may uh, experience uh, from wake waves while it's moored against the pier. So just a little background information. The tank, the test was done in David's uh, laboratory tank three back at our university. Um, I listed some of the dimensions in case. Um, the, the towing tank was uh, equipped with a monorail towing carriage run by steel cables and an electric motor. And the wave maker was a drive back, um, excuse me, a uh, flap type wave maker uh, with the use of six paddles. And the wave maker was capable of generating um, regular and spectral waves up to two feet. So this is the model that we used. Um, we, have, we installed an IMU, an inertial measurement unit box, in the center of the ship right here to be able to um, uh, take in all the numbers. Uh, we put, we used a scale factor of 60. Um, we included a chart of all the dimensions from the model and the full scale. Um, and in addition to the ballast weight that we used uh, just to keep track of all the, uh, the weight that we were including inside. Um, yes. And to set up our experiment, we first uh, created a makeshift pier, and we actually attached it to the towing carriage itself, so that it was uh, lowered to right, right about water level. And against the pier, we installed four foam fenders uh, that we placed the uh, starboard side of the ship on um, against. Uh, and for the moorings lines arrangement, we were able to use a program called Optimore, luckily. Um, we, were, we were able to get our hands on that program, which helped us uh, figure out our mooring lines arrangement. Um, through the program, we were able to test out different types of lines or different types of lines with different positions along with different numbers of fenders and fender types in addition to customizable waves from diff coming from different directions and we were able to get some preliminary information from this, from these tests uh, to be able to have a more uh, focused test on with the tank. So for the actual testing, we were te basically testing for the worst case scenario. Um, the wake waves weren't too big of a threat for our project, so, but we wanted to test it to make sure, of course, since our project is going to be housing people, we need to make sure it's safe and also comfortable for the users. Um, for the waves, we used a two-foot wave uh, because it was the actual scaled waves from the Hudson River, but we also included a 4.7-foot wave in full scale, which is uh, just an arbitrary number that we chose that's double the original number just to have an extreme number to compare our uh, results. Uh, we tested the ship in head and following seas. Between every run, the waves were stopped and um, a skimmer was ran, and the uh, ship was actually rotated in 30 degree increments until all the all directions were covered. Uh, we actually used a catwalk to have that easy access to the IMU, in addition to um, being able to uh, having the capability to rotate the ship however, however way we wanted. And uh, we and again we focused mainly on ship uh, motions. Um, the X, Y, and Z values of the acceleration were also found, but they were very small numbers being about 0.01 Gs or lower, so they were negligible. In addition to the um, pitch and yaw, which were very low values, but the, roll, but the roll values were the important ones, and I'll be explaining those later. 
So this, these graphs explain the wave spectrum. Um, this is the left graph shows the two foot wave and the right graph shows the 4.7 foot wave. Uh, the, we graph the spectral energy against the frequency just to have a, a little understanding about, about the wave conditions that would be uh, the, the model would be in. And in addition to the time series, we cut, we had 100 second snippets of the 2 foot and 4.7 foot waves again. Uh, the, in the first graph, you can see that the elevation goes from about about an inch to a negative inch, um, a bit lower, which is what we were expecting. In addition to the 4.7 foot wave, which has a lot uh, larger waves, from ranging from positive three to negative three, sometimes going even higher. And this is the roll velocity that we plotted down. Uh, we, wrote, we plotted from zero to 180 degrees. Um, for the 4.7 foot wave, we were uh, unable to include the 150 and, 100 and 180 degree a heading due to some data error. However, we were able to um, notice that one pattern where at 90 degrees heading, the ship would experience the, max, the most uh, roll velocity. Um, we use the RMS values in degrees per second for the purpose of these charts, but um, acknowledging the fact that the first graph doesn't go over about 7 degrees per second and the second one doesn't go over about 13 degrees per second, we were able to conclude that the roll wouldn't be too drastic and be a problem basically for our project. These are acknowledgments. We'd like to thank Professor Roger Datla from uh, Stevens for advising, our, uh, advising us through the project, in addition to Mr. John Miller, who helped us with all the coastal aspects, and the Office of President's Life and Stevens Institute of Technology for sponsoring this project. And this, in addition to um, our consultants, Joe Weatherby, Matt Woods, and John Flory, who all took hand in uh, assisting us with this research. Thank you. Oh, right. We'll join our other team and say, if only. <laughs> Any questions? That would be discussion. Uh, do you know anything about the push ship was the best option? Are uh, all of the ship you looking at? <laughs> Yeah, so the the advantage to the cruise ship is that it already um, is kind of designed to be lived on in a sense, so the renovation costs are much smaller, um, and it's set up, you know, for shore power, which is something we really have to consider with the barge, um, and plumbing and everything is hopefully going to be in good shape and structurally um, wouldn't be a problem for us. Uh, the frigate would be kind of similar in that it should be in good shape, um, but any frigate would be acquiring would be rather old um, and even some of the chemicals on board are very expensive to clean or remove. Um, so for cost reasons, the cruise ship, it seems, is our best option. Um, but like I said, our cost analysis was very preliminary, so mm -hmm. that could be. Oh. I just wondered oh, how the, the age of the ship you were yes. saying, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Most of the Sorry. ones that we're currently seeing for sale at the moment are uh, from the late 60s, early 70s. But um, a lot of these Baltic cruise lines who have ships from maybe like the early to mid 90s are in the process of building new vessels um, that meet increasingly strict environmental regulations, especially among the Scandinavian countries. So we're hoping that within a few years, there's actually going to be much newer and much nicer um, cruise ships that will also be on the market as they get replaced for um, more you know, environmentally friendly ships under operating conditions, which we really won't need to worry about ourselves. So how soon do you actually plan, how soon is the problem that the administration is not aware of? It's now. It's now. It's now. It's now. It's now. It's now. Exactly. So but by the time they actually get all of their ducks in a row. Because you just mentioned about a few years from now, mm -hmm. new ships. So I thought you had a, you say you have a little time, maybe you will consider one of the older ships, especially the one from SUNY Maritime. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, they're building a new one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I might have missed it, but when you look at the ship to the map, how do you compare it with the limitation of physical length breadth uh, of the vessel that you can fit into your space? So that's actually a cost consideration for us, is that we totally understand that for so many of these ships we would have to do a ton of dredging. Um, luckily the channel is very close to where we intend to moor, so the channel would accommodate the vessel, but then the berth itself would actually be dredged. 
there is no peer in place, so that's part of our proposal is to build a peer. So that could be customizable um, to whatever length we require. From a conversion viewpoint, you might be surprised that you can get some relatively new bulk carry mm -hmm. that you may want to convert because of the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in terms of outfitting that. Yeah. But yeah. actually, the container types. Yeah, we looked at a lot of different options, um, and there were a lot of different ones. There was even um, some really snazzy houseboats that we saw. Um, we just kind of picked the kind of basic three, like a container ship. We thought the barge would also kind of, you know, that has the modular housing that could apply to different types of vessels, but we wanted to try to just pick three that we could stick with. Yeah. Our biggest issue with um, the bulk carriers, which we did briefly consider, um, was the fact that in New Jersey, every dormitory is required to have a certain amount of window area mm -hmm. compared to wall area. So yeah, unless you wanted to punch yeah, a lot of holes out of the wall, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't really be feasible to put all of these rooms inside, even though, you know, from a cost effective standpoint and from ease of transportation, it, it might be so. ideal, but to meet regulations, mm -hmm. not as much. So our version of that becomes the deck barge. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously in Stevens, the, or in Hoboken in general, Steven Student Lead Housing is a massive portion of the real estate market. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you guys looked into it all in your financial analysis of what effect have putting a massive new dormitory like this on campus would have on the price of the real estate market and where the new equilibrium would lie. Uh, so interestingly, um, Stevens is actively losing our lease contracts with apartment buildings. Uh, Hoboken is getting very gentrified and um, they don't necessarily like living next door to college students. So um, we would just kind of expedite the trend that we're already seeing, uh, which is them trying to edge us out at the same time that we're trying to continue expanding the student population. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Given the, the shallow water depth in the area, was the possibility of a jack-up structure support? Um, not as much, no, no. We've been focusing mostly on uh, grounding the vessels, uh, which would be mm -hmm. pretty easily acquired. So. It'd be interesting to look at in the future, absolutely. We'll add that in the recommendations. <laughs> yeah. well, with, with the other alternative, I realize this is a long audience to say this in, <laughs> but what about uh, basically because the water depth is, is shallow as they are, basically reclaiming the land, you know, land reclamation, or actually <laughs> building it out of here? Uh, yeah. so we are uh, we're very familiar in Hoboken and Jersey City uh, with land rec reclamation projects, and they haven't gone exceptionally well. If you actually go back to the real estate um, cost, uh, so you see, there's one green area of Hoboken where it's like cheap to buy property. I live back there. It's because it floods a couple times a week. Um, so that that is all reclaimed land. Um, I wear rain boots a lot for days after it rains. So um, unfortunately for Hoboken, um, especially right there on the water where we have a lot of um, wake wave activity, uh, land reclamation would be, I think, a lot more difficult and would require a lot of maintenance uh, if it were to be even marginally successful. Um, peer wise, it's actually. Uh, an interesting um, idea. There are a lot of dilapidated piers um, towards the north side of campus. Um, those are not Stevens owned. I'm not entirely sure why they haven't been bought up by somebody and turned into like apartments or some sort of usable real estate. Um, not entirely sure about that. Again, like they just kind of sit there and are crumbling into the river. Uh, I would assume that there's some reason. Um, I know that up in this direction, we have a couple super fun sites, which is grand. Um, whereas down uh, towards the south end, it might be worth looking into um, actually just building the piers themselves with the housing on top. I'm not having to get any approvals from the city. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, I've actually had a lot of very fun phone calls with people who have no idea what the process would be like. Um, <laughs> actually, Stevens itself didn't realize that we owned a lot of the waterfront property down here. I had to call all sorts of different records facilities to figure that out. Um, so I think it would be a little bit of a painful uh, permitting process from that standpoint because it is like 
such a different idea for modern Hoboken to have a permanently moored vessel. Uh, we would not only have to meet, you know, various hydrostatic uh, like safety concerns, but also uh, the standards for like land-based apartment buildings. We have to meet those safety concerns as well, along with you know whatever university standards are in place. So we would have to go through all sorts of different um, levels of permitting. In public too, <laughs> permanent ship there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. also discussed that, and we kind of try to turn it into maybe more of an educational or like a historical thing. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can get the community involved. Like we talked about, um, we might even keep the engine and propeller on, mm -hmm. so we can use it as a, um, a lab kind of thing for the naval students. We even talked about making it more part of Stevens history, Hoboken history. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it could be even turned into like. A museum or something more interactive for the community. There's a lot of kids, young children, so definitely something that we would try to like pull the community in and get them involved. And if you all have ever been to Stevens, you know that we sit on top of a huge cliff and this ship would be potentially moored right in front of that cliff, so mm -hmm. we wouldn't be blocking any views. <laughs> the rock wall might not be able to see the city anymore, but that's not a huge concern. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned the plan was to ground the ship, so have you guys look into like stability and structural hazards that might follow with that. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a little bit with um, one of our advisors, as mentioned on here, was um, an engineer for the Intrepid, and that's a huge problem they have is the Intrepid is grounded um, and it continues to sink <laughs> into the mud. And so that's a problem they face on a maintenance basis continually mm -hmm. where they have to dig it out. And of course, there's some erosion accompanying that. So um, that has kind of been considered in our maintenance cost, um, but it's essentially unavoidable for us. Um, so it's just something we're dealing with. <laughs> Thank you.